Jason McNeil of Appalachia Technologies here, and this is Security Snark, where we discuss all the cybersecurity news that's worth discussing. Hello, everybody, and this week on Security Snark, defense contractors are still highly susceptible to ransomware attacks despite efforts by the Pentagon. Uh, to help secure our supply chain by the CMMC. Uh, a new report shows that common cloud misconfigurations could be exploited literally in minutes, which is something that my own personal experience uh, verifies. Uh, the uh, NCSC has warned that American industry and academia once again are being targeted for intellectual property theft. Uh, and finally, multiple bugs enable eavesdropping on 30, 37% of Android smartphones. Pretty alarming. And first up comes uh, this piece from HelpNetSecurity.com, and this says defense contractors are highly susceptible to ransomware attacks, which is true. Um, and I picked this piece. This piece is interesting to me because I don't think that really captures the entire threat landscape as far as our defense contractors go. And uh, the leading uh, line here says 20% of America's largest 100% one, or largest 100 defense contractors are highly susceptible to a ransomware attack, according to research from Black Kite. Uh, so now keep in mind here, this says 100 uh, largest defense contractors. So these are all going to be companies that are in the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in top line revenue. Um, they don't represent the small to mid sized business space at all. Um, and there's something like 300,000 defense contractors total. This is a sample of 100 of them. So uh, this is not a good sample, so, uh, a good sample size, right? Not only that, uh, it's a sample of the 100 largest ones. And you would assume that if the 100 largest ones had good security, the rest, that would be representative of, uh, of some of the rest anyway. Uh, but even still, it says 20% of, of, of America's largest 100 defense contractors are susceptible to ransomware. Okay, um, so these are companies that should have good cyber defense and they still don't because uh, they're the 100 largest, they have lots of money. And it, it goes on to say here that contractors are showing high compliance levels. This isn't right. And I know this because I personally assessed dozens of them. Some of them were large and some of them were small. And in the beginning of this, it says 100 of the 100 percent, 100 of the largest defense contractors. But then it says contractors showing high compliance levels, and it goes on to uh, grade them as having an overall security posture of of, uh, of a B grade, having a B grade. This isn't right. So this article is correct in the respect that defense contractors are still highly susceptible to ransomware attacks, but the conclusions that it draws. Uh, showing that uh, these contractors have high compliance levels and that they receive an overall grade of B is not true. This is this is misleading. So uh, this article is interesting. Read it anyway uh, and then draw your own conclusions here. But still, defense contractors and everybody else are still susceptible to ransomware. And the reason why the threat actors use ransomware is mainly to make money, but not always. Um, sometimes ransomware is used as a uh, as a, a guise for other things that are going on, uh, the exfiltration of other information or advanced persistent threat toeholds and that kind of thing. Um, very very interesting. And first up comes uh, this piece from Cyware.com. Common cloud misconfigurations could be exploited in minutes. Uh, it's a report. So this article is about a uh, honeypot project that was done by some researchers. And at Palo Alto, and what a honeypot is, is you put out uh, computers or virtual machines on the internet that are deliberately misconfigured and deliberately weak. And this is for the purpose of attracting attackers so that you could study their methods and see exactly what they're doing. Um, it's a way to find zero day exploits, for example. Um, you could cap capture all that traffic. So think of it as deliberately low hanging fruit intended to attract, uh, you know, uh, deer, right? That's, that's what your hackers are. So in this case, it says here, the researchers used a honeypot infrastructure containing of 320 nodes and deployed it globally. So 320 nodes, that's a decent size footprint. And they put these things, you know, globally all over the internet uh, to, make, to make sure that they would be found. Uh, they misconfigured the primary services within the cloud, including RDP, remote desktop protocol, SSH, secure shell, Postgres database, the database program, uh, and SMB. 
now, to be fair here, these are these are all these services are all easy to exploit uh, if they're improperly configured or if they're out of date or anything like that. So they put out 320 nodes and they put out these deliberately weak services and then they misconfigure them. Yeah, these things are going to get hit. So we know it's going to get hit. But um, what's interesting is you'd be surprised to find out how quickly and how often these things get hit. And I did a project like this when I was in graduate school at Penn State. We put out uh, a couple of SSH servers that were deliberately misconfigured. And then we captured a bunch of passwords and stuff like that and graphed it all. And uh, the results are shocking, right? So what do they find? So 320, uh, 320 nodes deployed it globally, okay? So about 80% of the honeypots were compromised within 24 hours. 24 hours, one day, and the rest were compromised within a week. Uh, SSH accounted for the most attacked application. SSH is insecure, it shouldn't be exposed on the internet if you can avoid it. Um, and if you do, you have to make sure you use multi-factor authentication, keep it updated, uh, those kinds of things. VPN is best. Uh, so again, 80% of the honeypots were compromised within 24 hours. So what this means is that if you deploy a machine connected to the internet, whether it's in the cloud or not, to be insured, uh, you know, Amazon, whatever, Google Cloud, whatever, and it's not properly configured, then it's going to get compromised very, very quickly. There is no secure security through obscurity on the Internet. And the analogy that I make with this stuff oftentimes is think of uh, a blue whale that's just swimming through the ocean. I think it's a blue whale. They're the ones that eat krill, right? And uh, these you're the krill, right? They're just they're just patrolling the ocean and then they're vacuuming up the krill. Uh, so these are automated bots and they just kind of patrol the internet like the ocean, like blue whales uh, eating, eating the krill. And they do it 24-7, 365, and these are automated processes. And then it notifies a human actor when they've actually gotten a toehold in something like that. Um, so th this is why defense in depth is so important. And I've said this many times, but the old school model of the firewall on the edge and then automated patching and then endpoint protection just doesn't work. You have to have, uh, you know, pat, a patch and test, man, a patch management, a patch and vulnerability management. You have to have uh, a protective technology such as SIEM, IDS, vulnerability scanning and that kind of thing. Um, full blown cybersecurity. If you have any assets on the Internet, if they're directly uh, exposed to the Internet and you're running these services that they're talking about here, RDP, remote desktop protocol should never be exposed to the internet. SSH, I don't like to see that exposed to the internet. Postgres, definitely not. Um, SMB, definitely not. None of these things should be exposed to the internet directly. Um, and if you're doing that, sometimes we find that it's operationally necessary due to some type of like software or something like that, then you need to have compensating controls in, in place. But that's interesting article uh, on, on these honey pots and we'll be looking for um, more of this research from Palo Alto's Unit 42 appears to be very good, very interesting. And next up comes this piece from CSOonline.com, uh, which is a resource that I like a lot, and I recommend hitting this one uh, every day or a few times a week. Uh, a few times a week. Uh, the NCSC, that it's the National Counterintelligence and Security Agency, uh, warns industry, academia, foreign threats to their intellectual property. And again, like the ransomware thing, this has been a recurring thing that's been going around the cybersecurity space for uh, a number of years now. And the principal threats to uh, American intellectual property are China, Russia, probably Iran, North Korea, some others. And China in particular, they've been pretty transparent about some of their goals and they want to lead uh, you know, dominate the academic and the industrial center uh, or uh, sectors uh, globally by 2030. And American universities, especially higher education, advanced degrees in the STEM, secure uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math fields, uh, still remains the envy of the world. And we attract students from all over the world. So it's, it wouldn't exactly be a surprise that China was, uh, you know, targeting these institutions. And learning institutions, they tend to be, they're, they're knowledge institutions and their purpose is to convey knowledge. And they tend to be pretty open. And when you do scraping, uh, you know, Google hacking, scraping and stuff like that, looking for files in the .edu top level domain, it's kind of surprising what you'll find. You know, PDFs, documents, all, all kinds of interesting intellectual property. And then the students, they can be, you know, kind of careless, so they get targeted. But this is a this has been a, a constant problem in the academic space, and it's gonna it's gonna get worse. They've been pretty clear about what they're trying to do. Uh, they're following through with it, 
and American academic institutions need to be on top of this. And finally, uh, this piece from infosecurity-magazine.com, multiple bugs enable eavesdropping on 37% of Android phones. It sounds alarming. And that this headline here is a little clickbaity. And the reason I say that is, while this is true on its face, um, this article admits that this attack is theoretical and there's no actual, there's no evidence of it actually being used. That doesn't mean that it wasn't. Uh, but in any case, security researchers, they've revealed new vulnerabilities in a popular Android chip, uh, a chip which could have allowed, which could have allowed threat actors to snoop on the audio of nearly 37% uh, of the world's smartphones. Now it points out here that this is one of the chips and it's in an Android set. And there's a bunch of them in there. And when we talk about microchips that are in a smartphone, people tend to think of the CPU or the central processing unit, which runs the operating system itself. And those um, out of the box, as long as they're kept patched, they are reasonably secure. But keep in mind, there's a bunch of other chips that are in these. There's a bunch of other chips that are in these handsets besides just the CPU, these uh, you know, baseband processors uh, and audio, audio video processors and a bunch of other things. And there are ways to get into these things uh, as well, not just the CPU. And the way I understand it, when you have these advanced, uh, you know, nation state type of attacks that come from uh, Israel or the CIA or from Russia or China, from the PLA or whatever, um, the way that they're getting into these smartphones is by using zero, zero day type of exploits on these ancillary supporting chips. And these are, uh, these are advanced attacks and these things are difficult, uh, difficult to detect and to, uh, uh, and to mitigate. But, you know, keep in mind, everything that we do has some level of risk. And even if you take these things out of the box and then you apply all the patches to them, you can't just assume that they're secure um, because they're definitely not. Um, and another, another interesting piece, uh, more stuff from the cyber news. And that's all we have for this week on the Security Snark. Thank <laughs> you.